Hi guys and welcome to This Is Us, a talk show where we have a conversation around various topics. I'm your host Dee and on the panel we have Jude. Good evening all. We have G. Hello. And we have Tyler. Evening everybody. Thank you for tuning in this evening. Um, since you're here, please take this moment to hit the notification, um, the bell, and subscribe to this channel for updates. Oh yes, and don't forget to hit the like, like this video. Today's topic is all about mental health, mental health, the, the reality. For the last 18 months, things has not been normal. It's not been how we, we've seen things to be. But we'll go on to talk about the pandemic and how it's affected mental health. But first of all, we're going to look at mental health with women. Now, women are more likely to be treated for mental health problems, more than men. This could be because when asked, women are more likely to report symptoms of common mental health problems such as depression. Jude, why do you think depression is more common in women than in men? Tough question. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an expert by any chance on mental health issues. Uh, but from what I've read and from discussions with women, uh, especially women uh, who have started to have children, uh, uh, they, they kind of linked it to prenatal and postnatal, uh, after pre-birth and after birth. And um, yeah, that's, that's why that is. And also because uh, they've linked it uh, to how society views women and uh, the, the, the position that society put, places women in. So like uh, the homemaker, at the same time, they have to uh, re watch uh, for the child or the children. They have to make ends meet somehow why the father figure in the house is the one that is better to go make money and bring money to the home. So they're in that situation, that bubble for a period of time. It becomes routineous for them. And yeah. as a result of that, they kind of neglect their health, so to speak, because they're in that whole bubble of looking after the children, doing one or two things, not going out, mostly missing out on going out with their friends or meeting friends or relatives or even catching up with clubs, that, things that they could do for themselves. Uh, this is from few discussions that I've had. So it's mainly that reason. It's not that men don't have it, but it's, again, we don't show it mostly. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, G, one in four women will require treatment for depression as compared to men, which is one in 10. What's your views in regards to that when they say that women are more likely to suffer from mental health issues than men or women suffer more from depression than men? What is your views on that, G? Um, I actually think um, apart from, I know you'd mentioned the prenatal and postnatal, which is a thing and is very real. Uh, because women have, we naturally just have more hormones running through our bodies than men. There's just a lot more going on in our minds and our bodies than with men. So that's my, I mean, I'm not a science expert, or anything, but that's my reason behind it because we have, I mean, you hear about women that when they have PMS, which is um, premenstrual syndrome, um, it can be really, really bad. And in some cases dangerous because it's like they're completely different personality. And uh -huh. it's taken lots of women many, many years to realize that there's a serious imbalance in the chemical whatever that goes on in the brain during you know a full moon or whatever they say um like a week before their periods or whatever so for me it's quite i think it's i mean with everything women have to go through anyway i think it's 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 understandable to an extent that we would have some sort of um mental health issues that a lot of the time it, this is not just a black woman thing it's just a woman thing of, oh, you're strong, you can bear it. And people just kind of, you just kind of get used to it. And you know, it's just part of being a woman. Be, um, mm -hmm. Someone said to me this week, um, beauty is pain. And I said, I don't say that in my life because I don't accept it. Or like just other things that women have to go through that I think they probably don't need to, but it's the norm. And also part of the norm is accepting that it's okay not to like discuss it or talk about it because you're a woman, so you're supposed to go through it. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. It does. Yes. Con um, but 
it's the same with men though. Could it be that the reason why the statistics is so high for women is because men do suffer from depression, but they don't state the symptoms. So for example, when they visit the GP, they sort of are underdiagnosed because men are supposed it's to not be- not just that. It's also the thing of, um, what's that phrase, man up. Like that's one of the most detested phrases for me to hear. When mm. someone's clearly going through something, you say man up. And that means that they don't talk to anybody about it because it's not, it's the same people that say, oh, men are not supposed to cry. Like you're not meant to be vulnerable. And when you, again, it's a historically um, normal way of looking at men or you have to man up. You don't cry, you don't show this, you don't show that. And to kind of show any sort of emotion, sometimes it's looked at as being weak. So yeah. I think it's a society thing of just, you know, you have to be strong, you're a man, you don't do this, you don't do that. So no man is gonna go to the GP willingly, well, not most men anyway, and say there's something wrong with my head. And I think for both men and women, the fact that mental health is something you can't see, you can't, it's not tangible. You can't, like someone was saying, like, you know, if somebody has cancer, you can see the effects on their body, or if they have this, if they have that, they've been in an accident, you can see like physical manifestations of an injury to somebody. But when it's mental, you can't put your finger on it. And sometimes mm. the person themselves can't actually explain in normal words what's going on with them for them to even be able to go to a GP to say, I think something's wrong. Because sometimes they just say, oh, maybe you're just tired. You just need to sleep more, or whatever. And it's not. I think that's why I'm, I'm sort of against the statistics, because the statistics does say that women are more likely to suffer from depression. But we know that men do carry a lot of their shoulders mm-hmm. on their shoulders. Yeah. They just don't speak yeah. out. They don't yeah. speak up. Um, mm-hmm. Tyler, how do you feel as a man in regards to when we speak about talking about our emotions and um, expressing yourself, especially when you know, we all know what it means to look after ourselves and our well being. But as a man, to know we need to speak up, how do you feel about that, Tyler? Um, yeah, I think G and Jude have hit the nail on the head, really. And, you know, we know that men don't speak up as much as. A, women, and B, as much as they should. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of men do suffer from depression and mental health. Um, that's a fact. Um, and, you know, things like suicide obviously come into that, which a lot of men commit suicide, of course, as well. So I think it's it's becoming, you know, it's a new, it's not a new thing, but it's, it's a newer thing to especially, you know, my generation and above, yeah. I would say, for us to start talking out because we were the generation that got told to man up, to not cry, to be wow. tough, all that kind of stuff. So now it's kind of newer generation is coming through where they're saying, no, men should speak up and all this kind of stuff. You know, in the last few years, it's probably the first time in my life that I even thought about, okay, yeah, you know, speak out about this stuff and all that, you know, so it shows that it's not, it's not really been around for, for very long or mm-hmm. that platform for men to kind of speak up. You know, I think it's a great thing. Um, and I've even changed my opinion over the years on certain things like, you know, especially like the whole man up thing, because I would have got told that growing up. So I probably would have thought up to a few years ago that that's how I should be if I'm ever going through something. But now I know that, you know what, that's not the way I, I should I should speak up. And, you know, and I have people around me, you know, there's still there's still certain people that I guess I wouldn't show certain things to. But then yeah. at least I've got the, the certain people that I do and yeah. will things too so you know I think as, as long as you have the few a few confidants around you mm-hmm. then yeah by all means yeah. speak up speak up definitely they've said there that women are twice likely to experience things like anxiety um mm-hmm. compared to men and of, mm-hmm. of that some of them suffer from things like phobia or even OCD um mm-hmm. I'm just gonna ask this one G do you have any phobias or do you have, because I know I do have OCD to certain things. Do you have a phobia or OCD to anything, G? Um, I do suffer from mental health um, um, things. I don't like to say issues or problems, mm-hmm. just, you know, my mental health well-being is not where it should be. And majority of mine comes from my childhood so there's a lot of trauma stuff that I haven't dealt with that I am dealing with I am in therapy currently which is really helping uh but in terms of phobias I don't have any phobias but I have had 
I don't know. I don't think it's. I don't know what it's called. I forgot to Google the name, but it's a phobia of. It's it's a kind of severe kind of anxiety where you're afraid to be in a crowd of people of more than like two people. Yeah, yeah. and I had Agor- that. Agoraphobia. I, had that, okay. I think that's the agoraphobia is the one you don't want to go out. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah. I've had it yeah. twice. Yeah. I've had it twice. It came and went. So I used to work in a call center. I think it was dialophone or something years ago. And for some reason, after like my first day at the place or whatever, I got this phobia thing where someone would have to come into reception. You can imagine what a call center looks like. There's lots of people on the phone doing whatever. And someone would have to come and get me a reception, like a colleague, and walk me to my desk. And I would walk in like with my head down like this, get to my desk, and then I'm fine. And then if I need Mm. to go to the bathroom, somebody has to go with me to the bathroom and wait for me outside. It was really weird. It went on for a few months and then it disappeared. And then I got it again, not too long ago. I can't remember what the setting was, but it's just this, like your heart is beating so fast. You can't hear anything but your heartbeat. And everything is just drowning out. And I do get panic attacks as well. I haven't had one in a very long time. But when I get them, it can last for four days where it's just, it's a nightmare. But in terms of phobias, the, the crowd one is the only one I remember and for for many the times that people are like, oh come out come out and I'm like okay I don't want to go out I don't want to go anywhere I but think we're all, I just don't want to be around crowds we're all in we all sort of feel the same because I know I posted on Instagram or a while back me in Camden and Jude's response to that was, <laughs> <laughs> no way no yeah. way too much crowd too many people no mask it's just busy yeah um, I think especially bearing in mind this pandemic we really do not want to be too, too much in a too many people in a small space. Yeah, um, yeah. we're really trying to avoid that. Um, but we've spoken a little bit. I know um, we spoke a little bit about women, but I'm now going to sort of turn it over to men because it does say that a lot of men they do suffer from mental health issues. But one of the biggest issues that they have when it comes to men is things like alcohol and drug problems. Um, Jude. How do you feel when they put it back? Because the statistics goes to say when it comes to things like depression, anxiety, they focus more on women. But then they've said drugs and alcohol goes to men. Jude, what's your view in regards to that? Very fine question. Uh, I've always, when I, when I hear uh, questions like that, I always ask, which one comes first? The mental health before the drugs and alcohol or hmm. the alcohol and drugs before the mental health? So we really can put our finger on it. Uh, yeah, I think for men, for me, I'll speak for myself, is, I think Tyler mentioned about it, it's, or you mentioned it, it's, it's about not knowing the symptoms of what mental health is anyway. So you really can't put a finger to it. You just think, oh, I'm tired. I've not had proper mm. sleep. And you wake up, you, you go have proper sleep and you're back on. So sometimes you snap, you don't know why you did it. So those symptoms, it's not like, I grew up in Nigeria, first 25 years of my life. So it's not like this is some discussions I had with people uh, uh, older than me. You know, it's only yeah. looking back that I realized that a lot of people had ill mental health, especially my teachers in secondary school who whipped the blood out of us. So it's looking back that I realized they were really, really not right up in their head, you know. Mm. So for men, for me, um, like when my mom died in 2016, yeah, I just graduated from school, shared the good news with her. And two weeks later, mom was gone. And um, mm. I went, and two weeks later, I was to start my first job as a social worker. I had to walk through it and all. I even just asked some friends who come to mass, I even asked them to stop coming. I didn't know what was going on. I walked through, I thought that way, I would deal with this loss. Yeah. And um, until I had sort of a breakdown, I was drinking heavily at the time. But I just thought yeah. of whatever, but it wasn't affecting me. I, I could sit down and go through a bottle of whiskey with, with my friend and I'll go to work the next day, it would affect my job, but I didn't know. Until the things I started seeing at my workplace, started to affect me seriously. I, and I'm not going to lie, I would meet some people who were very old and they, their life was like just going down. They had dementia and they're begging to die. And I remember once like, you're begging to die. My mom's just gone. She's, she was only 68 and I would tear and all of that. It was only, then my manager sat with me during supervision and said, you need to go through the stages of bereavement. Your mm-hmm. mental health is not where it should be. But again, as a man, I knew if I tried that, <laughs> This is lack of information as well. I didn't know anything about it. I don't think I read my contract. So I didn't know whether they would support me. 
And I was worried about whether they would give you some tag because they're quick to say, yeah. you've got this, you've got that. Nobody wants a tag hanging around them like your mm -hmm. name tag. Yeah. I've got that heavy already, you know? So mm -hmm. I didn't do any of that. I just came back home, continued to go to work because I'm, I'm the breadwinner. Yeah. So my thinking is if I don't make that bread, the mm -hmm. family is going to fall out. And this is the hidden aspect yeah. of mental health. It leads people mm -hmm. to lose their homes, their families and everything around us. Mm -hmm. So yes, I drank heavily at that point. And another point that I was almost starting to drink heavily again was when we went into lockdown, when Boris Johnson, because all the anxiety, I wasn't worried about COVID. I was telling my friends, whoever would die, would die of this. It's, this is evolution, survive for the fittest. But that yeah. evening when we were all sat waiting for him to announce that we were going to some sort of lockdown, when he announced it, I'm not joking. I thought something just left my life and I became ill for the three days and it was my birthday week. So you can see these are all anxieties and panic attacks. But as a man, again, I just took it, oh, I'll be over it. Yeah. And I realized I was drinking every day. Yeah. Little, little drip, little, little things. Well, you're not I drinking heavily. I think the whole, the whole nation was, to be fair. Yeah, so because, <laughs> because you were not drinking heavily, was just, you wouldn't you know, think you have an issue. Mm. Yeah. So we see people who drink a bottle of vodka or two liters of vodka a day as the ones who have issue. Also, the one who's drinking just a can of beer, you have an issue too because you weren't doing that previously. So that period, it happened. But I don't do drugs. I don't do any of those recreational drugs or anything so good. But again, it goes, like I first said, which one comes first, the mental health or the drugs and alcohol or the drugs and alcohol before the mental health? Yeah. We don't know this, especially we can't put our fingers. So the, the experts can, but I really can't put my finger to it. Yeah, because mental health does affect men and women both equally. But um, but for women, it's it's common. Some aspects of it is, is even more common. But what I was going to say was, I think with my experience with things like working at the London Ambulance Service, as well as working with young children, is I've come to the point where I think we all have some form of, um, we all need to sort of look at our mental health and our wellness. And I think how we deal with certain situations is sort of what puts us into where we fall. So some people might be going through depression, some people might be going through anxiety, but because the people do not want to be labeled as yeah. I'm, de I'm depressed or even down to those that are sectioned or that do have things like um, bipolar, um, they don't want to be, it's the word labeled, but then sometimes it's that whole reaching out for help that will help you, um, the, the sort of help that will help you in order for you to live your life. So it's the balance of being able to speak out. And I think that's both men and women, but it's more, men are the ones that really do not speak up. But Tyler, to Judas just started to talk about lockdown. How do you think lockdown has affected mental health? Um, well, I think that's, again, I don't know numbers and statistics and stuff, but I think that's, that's been a massive factor mm -hmm. to many people's lives. Um, yeah, you know, people, I think people have felt this, this imprisonment or felt like they've been trapped you know people mm -hmm. people have been used to freedom and doing what they want to do so you know being locked down and in your house and all that kind of stuff yeah I think that's massively led to to um mental health stuff you know I think it's it's a difficult one it's a difficult one for me when I'm talking about this because lockdown wasn't that bad an experience for myself mm. but I can still relate to people that may have and that's mainly because you know I've, I've got, we've got a child I guess so we had a routine and we still had to make things fun for her and all that kind of stuff so that that I guess was our savior um but for those that didn't have that or for those that have run their own or whatever it was I can imagine yeah. it just it must yeah. have just been terrible because all you have are are your four walls yes. and you know after a while FaceTime gets boring and you know at the start <laughs> we was all doing these zoom calls and yeah zoom quizzes <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> After a while, that gets boring, right? And then you're on your own. So, yeah, I think it's had a massive effect, even for children, for you know, youngsters that were at school yeah. that are now at home. Mm -hmm. I think they, well, who knows if they are impacted more than some adults? But I think you mm -hmm. know, I know they they would have been impacted massively. Mm -hmm. um, and again, these are things that we may not see now, but in a few years' time, we may see. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes, um, yes, exactly. Spot on. Uh, at the same time, I do believe that with the right guidance, with the right help, with people talking up, we can get through this. You know, we can get through these these kind of times. And the reason why I say that is because I speak to my wife about 
some things that I've experienced growing up. And to be honest with you, even though when I look back on it now and I'm like, they were terrible situations that I've been in, in terms of like, example, going to three different secondary schools because of unstableness with swapping parents and whatnot. I, I didn't, until I spoke about that, I didn't feel like I had a, I had any issue during that yeah. period. But when I look back on it, I'm like, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So I've just somehow, I don't know, put my guard up and got through it. Mm. But yeah. now years later on down the line, I'm speaking about it. So it's, it's healing me anyway, even though I didn't feel like I needed yeah. to be healed. Yeah. You know, so I think as long as you can talk about these, you know, as long as we give whoever felt like they, they went through a tough time, we need to give them time to speak. You know, if it's our children, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah. You know, you found it hard during lockdown. Okay, let's talk about it. Let's continuously talk about it. Let's not just shut them down and be like, okay, no, no, get over it. We're not in lockdown no more. Forget about that. You know, it's, it's just a constant com- conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Hopefully people, people heal from that, you know? Mm. Uh, but yeah, very tough. I know lots, a lot of people will be going through things, especially now that we are slowly opening back up. Things like anxiety, scared of coming outside. Um, some people are sort of, they've got used to the isolation now. So to yeah. now come and join the crowd, it's there's a bit of a phobia going on, or even mm-hmm. depression, being in being indoors. But one of the things that really gets me is the self-esteem. Um, geez, what? How do you feel? Think when we think about people, their self-esteem would have reduced. They'd have low self-esteem. How do you feel about that? Or what's your views in regards to that, G? Oh, uh, well, I <laughs> I'm laughing because. I, when I knew there was a roadmap for this whole coming out business, I was like, okay. And I, I did get a little bit, uh, what's it called? Social anxiety, I don't know, social anxiety, whatever. Cause I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to go out. I don't know if I'm ready to go out. But then as you guys know, I was, I'd already, I think what earlier this year, tried some sort of um, Nigerian weight loss thing. I was doing like, you know, meal plans and stuff. So I kind of already was on that one. Cause in my mind, I was like, I'm not coming out of this lockdown fatter than I went in. So if I come out the same weight I went in, I'll be happy. So I knew I had to do something. I started doing that already. So in a way, I kind of started working on my self-esteem before I even knew they had a vaccine, they had an an end date inside and all that stuff. So I can see how it's going to affect a lot of self-esteem. But I think also it might not because I've spoken to so many people that they're just so grateful to be alive and well that they don't actually care enough. I know people that don't normally go out before pandemic that are now raring to go. They want to go everywhere. They want to do everything. And they're not caring about how they look. Nobody I've spoken to has said anything about their self-esteem. They're just so happy to see other people rather than either their four walls or just the people that you know they normally see. So I think self-esteem from the people I've spoken to, it's not because, and I think if there was only one part of the world or one part of the UK that had the COVID, as I like to refer to it as, then you can start feeling, oh, they're okay or whatever. But because this was literally a a worldwide thing, we're all in it together. I don't know if you guys saw Will Smith post a picture of his lockdown body and he's (laughs) like, yep, this is the worst shape of my life that I've been in. And he was there standing proud. So I don't think I don't I don't think the self-esteem is quite you know bad and for me to get over my uh, social anxiety or slight social anxiety that I thought I had I ordered 16 dresses last week and it was really fun trying that I don't know where I'm going with them that is correct I'm wearing oh one of them now this is one of them <laughs> this is one of them Uh-oh. and I mean I sent nine of them back but that's not the point the point was just nice to... Why do women do something? that? We need, to have a, we need to have a conversation on that topic alone. Which one? <laughs> we why not send them back? Why we buy so many dresses and try them and send them back? Because when you go to the shops, it's different. I hate shopping and I hate trying dresses on. So if I go to... I don't like... If I'm going to a shop, I promise you I'm going to pick something up or I'll pick up two of the same thing in different sizes and I'll go to my house and try it on. I have 30 yeah. days to return it. The 16 dresses thing is the first time I've ever done anything like that. I'm like, you know what? COVID has changed everything, including me. So I thought, let me try. I tried everything on in one afternoon. I had my friend on video on um, WhatsApp video check it out with me. And she'd be like, no, yes, no, yes. And we went through, and it was just fun. And for me, it was just yeah. part of my getting rid of that social anxiety of, oh, 
I don't want to go out. I'm not ready to go out because the next thing is always, what am I going to wear? Sort of thing. So mm-hmm. I thought, let me just get rid of all of that stuff. I've already got my wig collection. Been naked the whole year, right? Now you have you to know? Wear Well, to be <laughs> fair, last year, all I did was buy a whole bunch of tracksuits and loungewear. Ah, That's all I did. Because I knew I wasn't going anywhere. I packed up everything else and I was in tracksuits and loungewear. Like, you know, those yeah. five pound ones from China. That was what so, I was you know, wearing. Everybody, yeah. I think, Somebody in the chat's put it there as well, that everybody has sort of gone through this in different ways. Mm. Um, G's spoken about buying those multiple dresses, but I know people that have um, things like, as you said, the dresses, they've done different things like different shoes. I bought sunglasses just to get myself ready to come out of lockdown. Um, Mm -hmm. So we all sort of do these little, little things just to keep us going. Um, Absolutely. Tyler touched on something in regards to our children's well-being mental health with children. Now, we know once the children were going back to school, quite a lot of parents could not wait to send their children back to school. But one thing that some parents, I believe, really need to sort of think about as well as, um, I think the government and the schools are looking into, the children's mental health and wellbeing, Mm. which is, as much as the children are in school, we've got children that are sort of They've, they've had to go through a lot in the lockdown. They've, they've having to now think about making friends, um, mm. how to conversate, to have conversations, just to be friend, like to play with other children. But then the one thing is the children that now start acting that they're sick in order to go back home because of the fear of being leaving their parents at home. They're mm. worried that their parents, something might happen to them. Um, Jude, what's your views in regards to how this lockdown or even just generally children and their mental health what are your views and bear in mind you're a social worker aren't you Jude? yeah i have three children so we've been lucky with them that uh, we didn't experience any of that and when i say luck where we live around where we live we've got fantastic greens outdoors and the Mm. the woods and the forest so Mm. i go out jogging every day before lockdown and in lock during lockdown i just increased it i go out jogging in the afternoon during lunch and after work I go out working for like an hour or two. And this has been our routine anyway with the children and all. So we're very, very lucky uh, with the location of our home that we've got, the, we've got access to this lovely outdoors. So mm. it was good for them. They didn't really miss, they were really, really like locked indoors with the TV. Yeah. That's one. And then going back to school, <clears throat> yes, uh, of course, I, I, I sat here working throughout the noise and all of that. So I was glad they were going back to school. In the first place, <laughs> but did my ch- children uh, 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 display any sort of anxiety? I think the last one is six years old. He did. He um, actually in- self-induced his own illness, and he didn't go to school for a week or two. Every of the symptoms of COVID that you hear outside, he had it indoors. <laughs> this was when he was asked to go back to school. So you can see he was he was telling on yeah. them. So what we normally do is don't put stress on them. What I thought wasn't really right from the very first lockdown. I think Tyler was trying to touch about it. It was um, immediately we went to lockdown that you have all these knuckleheads. I call them knuckleheads. They just flooded the internet with this quiz, this mask, that book, that yoga, that blah, that blah. I'm like, for Christ's sake, it's too much. Give us a break. Give the children a break. This break has come. You won't have it again. Don't bombard mm. them with English. Learn maths, learn physics. I cut off my children from that nonsense. I say, you ain't getting involved. Take your time. Enjoy this time. You will not have it again. The school mm-hmm. was very fantastic in support because they weren't bombarding them with a lot. It just bring a drip drip because they know both parents at home will be working. So we can't be putting it inside the kids. So I thought a lot of that affected the kids as well. At early stage, there was a young man outside of London, a young girl who committed suicide because of mm-hmm. the pressure. You know, I thought those pressure was too much because we thought we were indoors, but the pressure was right on us on Instagram. People were trying to say, get your shape in order. Man, what is it about the shape to get in order? It was just too much pressure. Some of these youngsters were really worried about how they would look when they came out. So they were 24 seven confused. But again, like I said, I was lucky with my own children because normally it's the way we live our life. We don't judge, we don't do any of that. We just low down, no pressure. Because yeah. that's, that's not what life is about. Because I was pressured when I was growing up, so I've tend to not do it that way. But obviously, it's right that Tyler pointed out the children. I'm really worried the aftermath, because the title says mental health and the reality. When we come out fully, that's when we'll begin to see the impact. 
of what's mm. been going on. Because a lot of them, they've, they've not been to their GP or to their doctors or wherever. They've not been yeah. to meet with friends. They don't even know what's happened to some of their friends. Our, mm -hmm. In our children's school, they lost some of their friends through fire. So a lot has happened. We don't know the impact now. So that's why I really can't tell, say much about mm -hmm. it. But the, yeah. the end game, when we come out finally, I just mm -hmm. hope that uh, the country or the nation can pull together and uh, go through the whole page. Because it's not just mm -hmm. about coming out. It's the end result of it all. Yes. Because with children, I'm, I've just got the one. And I just remember when we went into lockdown, our one thing was she's got nobody. It's just her on her own, no brother or oh, sister. Yeah, see. See. Um, yeah. And she was in year seven. So mm -hmm. first year of secondary school. And that's a critical year because that's when they start to make friends and things yeah. like that. So yeah. we, we had to send her in for key worker school for the mere fact of yeah. we both yeah. working. But yeah. it also got us, us thinking about things like anxiety, building her confidence. Um, yeah. Also her being able just to communicate, to talk to us, let us know how you feel. Because we also had to consider the children she'd be with. Because in a yeah. key worker school, you've got other key worker children whose yeah. parents are frontliners, whose yeah. parents, and then there's also the vulnerable children as well. But mm -hmm. I think with them returning back to school, they're now able to start having those conversations and being able to deal with the anxiety. But as, as Judah said, we won't know the full aftermath for a, a good couple of years. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, when we think about the children that were getting ready for things like their GCSEs or their A-levels, I, I can imagine with suicidal thoughts because they're thinking, oh my gosh, especially those that are really focused on what they want to be, where they mm -hmm. want to be. We know that some of our youths are very calculated in, in their future. Um, Tyler, what's your views in regards to that? When we think about those that miss their GCSEs, their A-levels. Terrible, it's terrible, it's horrible. It's, you know, and pushing on from that, the ones that missed out on, you know, school proms and, you know, saying yeah. goodbye to their friends, like the ones that are coming out of year yeah. six and into year yeah. seven. All that kind of stuff. I know, obviously, exams are important, but I'm talking like the social side of things as well. You know, it's 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 all terrible and all horrible. And it it got me thinking when you were talking just now. Do, do schools facilitate these kind of conversations these days? I'm not just saying because of COVID. Like before COVID, the schools. I don't know if anyone knows the answer to this, but do they? They do have. So the government put in place this September, September 2020. Um, they re they changed the PSHE curriculum and included it to be about health education. They wanted a bit more well-being. So it's whether the schools had already implemented that, mm -hmm. but it is something that the government already saw and were putting in place. So schools will be building upon that and trying to support mm -hmm. their children. To be honest, I wish yeah. they had that back in, in my day of school because, you know, when I, got, when I got kicked out of school for being just a naughty kid, if someone had spoke to me and realised, oh, hold on a minute, he's going to school in Edgware, but he's living with his stepdad in a pub in East London and he's travelling every day, all this kind of stuff, if there was a bit more support. Edgware to East London? Yes. Imagine, from, from um, um, near Barking, wow. somewhere like that. Uh, right? I didn't know you lived in a pub. I would have been your friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So this is the thing, though. This is like, for them children like me that probably needed that support, instead of just getting kicked out of school, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Part, actually, talk to me and find out what's going on. Do you know what I mean? So, mm. if, if schools are doing that a lot more, then that's that's a good thing, and hopefully, they'll yeah. continue with that. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's terrible, man. I just think again, and it's hard for parents as well because my, my immediate thing would be like, okay, parents, we need to keep on having these conversations with our children and stuff like that. But again, I've not been a parent that's had a child going to school whilst being, a, you know, being at home, I've not been in that situation, so it's hard for me to even say. Because I know that parents that have had, <clears throat> sorry, had children at home, it's been really tough for them because of work mm -hmm. as well. And yeah, so I just think, like I said earlier, it's just everyone just has to continuously keep on talking, I guess, and just. Uh, uh, Tyler, you said something about support, and again, just going back to the topic of today's uh, show, mental health. The reality, the reality is the support. What is out there? That's exactly why mm -hmm. a lot of us don't want to go, go talk about these things because. Would they just put you on pills? Would they just say, that's it, bye? There's no holistic approach to any of this, except you have some money or you have patience to wait for those holistic methods. You know, I'm a social worker. I know this since I've seen all of this support out there. What is there actually for people, like Tyler was saying, when you come out and for these children, 
or for an adult when they come out and say, hey, I, I think I'm not coping well, because the teachers are quick to give detention and all of that. But when they say, I think I'm not coping well, do they start, do they listen? Do they stop to really listen and say, can we support? Is that no, but, but if it's majority that's doing this, it's failing mm. everybody. Because one thing, I'm going to go, I'm going to say this. I know about African families and even some of the European families. They wouldn't want their children to be discussing this with their teacher because, hey, ho, that teacher's on the phone calling social services. Now, nah, nobody wants social services in their life. I've had some stories recently when I went to see a, a friend of mine who lost his father, and I was hearing things that uh, social services was doing to them through their uh, school. Because the social worker involved at the time was very knowledgeable and she had family as well, she saw that what the teachers reported was different, you know? Yeah. So if we have bad support out there, no one wants to go there. No one wants to be tagged. No one wants to be called anything. Oh, but don't, it's don't not well. Think, don't you think that'll be different now because of COVID? I, yeah, think, I don't I think, think so. That I don't have confidence. Different. I don't have confidence in it. I've been in this I, country long that I don't have that COVID. It's going to be a tick box approach. So again, I, it goes back to, to, to your individual self. I tell people, take some responsibility too. Don't think I'm just trying to be harsh. For your first, for your life, your health, Please take some responsibility. Mm -hmm. Every little thing that you could do. Look, mm -hmm. when, I, when we went into the lockdown, I realized uh, a guy died. Young man, he went home complaining about his legs. And the wife said, okay, sit down. I'm going to the shop with your son to get something. They came back. They had to break that door because no response. He died lying there. And I realized that he had uh, what we call the DVT, the deep vein thrombosis, yeah. blood clot. And it was, a, it, was, uh, it was from sitting down a lot. From that time, Early March, April last year, I started to encourage all my colleagues whenever we were on Zoom, do not sit there, walk around. Please, please walk around. You have responsibility because the support out there, is it really there? The support yeah. is not really there. It's not I really think, there if you don't have insurance. So, Because when we talk about adults, it's completely different to when we talk about children. But with children, there's a lot that's been put in place. I know schools especially turn into sort of, we sometimes question it whether we're teachers or whether we're carers. But the main, main factor, one of the first things as teachers we need to learn is safeguarding. So I know some schools do rush to call social services, depending on what the issue is. But there's a lot that's been put in place to support children. Tyler, you asked as to what's been put in place to support children that just need to have somebody to listen, to help them, mm -hmm. put, like just to mm -hmm. have that conversation. And there mm -hmm. are things like learning mentors. There's, they, they've actually, and they, they even get older children to, to talk to younger children. And yeah. they look around, they look at what they have in the school because they are seeing issues. If we're talking about mental health and the reality of it, if I just think about my local area, we've had a few issues lately where we've had, I'm going to put it there, we've had some stabbings. And my daughter gets the bus to school and she's turned around and said, mommy, I don't want to get on the bus. I'm scared. And I mm -hmm. said to her, well, but you've been getting on the bus all these years and there's not been an issue. So it's, I'm trying to sort of calm her down and, sort of talk it through, I said, it's happened. We know she read the story, she's of age, she's 13. So we sort of explained it to her. There was one in a school, in a secondary school occurred. And it's that whole having a conversation because I don't want her to have the anxiety of being able to go, not being able to go outside and be scared mm -hmm. to go into her local area. But we've lived in this area for seven, eight years. It's the first time this has happened. So I'm trying mm -hmm. to explain to her that it's happened. These things happen everywhere. I know it's not nice. We've seen it on the news. So it's mm -hmm. having those conversations with your children. But one thing I would say as well is speak to the school, speak to the provider. If they're still in school age, speak to the school because there is something. And the, the social services should be the last port of call. So mm -hmm. I know some parents are scared and they leave it for their children to speak and then social services are called. But even as a parent, if you've got issues, speak to the school, talk to them and they'll see what they can put in place. And I'm just, I'm, just, I don't know, I'm talking from my experience in regards to mm. being a teacher and I just, you see things where children do speak up and you think, hold on, but the parent, why couldn't they, if they told us something first, we could have put something in place to support them. So I mm. guess as, it works both ways and parents do need to speak up. But I think, but then we've also got that whole suffering in silence. So mm. G, um, G, when mm. we think about people that are suffering from mental health, but then those that suffer, and it's, it's stated, those that suffer in silence yeah how do we support those the ones that don't openly you can't really because we're not psychiatrists we're not doctors we can't tell how do we support 
especially those close to us that suffer in silence? Um, I'm obviously not a professional either, but I'm quite big on body language and I observe people a lot. And my husband's probably sick and tired of it, but I watch everything. I, I kind of, you know, I just know when somebody's okay and when you don't think they're okay. And I observe my husband, I observe my child, I observe my siblings, I observe my friends, like my close friends, I can tell from how they say hello, if they're okay or not. And the same goes for me. So I think it's having, when, when, if you're close to people and you know, like even my sister, like I think Tyler mentioned already, like just to have somebody to talk to, just to mm -hmm. talk. It's such a big thing. And I always say to my sister, I said, look, and she's younger than me. I'm like, even if you don't want to talk to me about it, I know there's something up. As long as you can find somebody, I say this to my brothers, my other sisters, just find one person you can talk to, that you can confide in. And even if you just want them to listen, just say, I just want you to listen. And then one thing my therapist actually um, told me about the other day, with, you know, regards to something else was, sometimes just write a letter, write an unsent letter. And it's just the way to get everything out because I think when you, and also, you know how with social media and everything as well, if you have something bothering you, you've got some mental health stuff you need to deal with that you probably don't even know you have, and you keep kind of exposing your brain to all this stuff that's on social media, one way or the other, something is going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. One way or the other, whether directly or indirectly, because whatever your, your, your face is consuming, your eyes are consuming, it's going into your brain somewhere and yeah. because the brain is doing whatever it's doing something will connect with something for you know it makes it worse so just find one person to talk you know how some people there'll be something wrong they don't talk to their friends and i think this just happened more with the facebook era they then put something on facebook like a status yeah, yeah. and then just yeah, to make yeah. people go oh are you okay are you okay i'm thinking mm -hmm. just talk to talk to a human but there has to be somebody you can talk to even yeah. if it's a neutral person that doesn't know you from anywhere you can always find someone to talk. So the whole suffering in silence, I understand if you're not in the mood to talk about something, like I, for one, don't like talking about anything. If I'm angry or if I haven't quite got my words right and I don't like to be misunderstood. I hate being misunderstood. So I'd rather wait till I'm calm enough. Me to and you are twins. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather wait till I'm calm enough to explain it or I'll write a letter or I'll write a note or I'll do a journal. I'm supposed to do a daily journal, but I don't have time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm busy. But, you know, just the whole suffering in silence, you're just killing yourself because your brain will find a way to go and take whatever this problem is, hide it somewhere, and then you can mask it with alcohol or whatever other addiction to kind of like ease the pain for that time. But it will come back because if you don't speak it out, and I think Tyler mentioned this, sometimes you don't realize how much all the stuff you've gone through in the past affects you as a person until you actually talk about it. Mm -hmm. I had one of those instances in a therapy session and she asked me a question where the question was just a normal question but the minute I started to respond I just get got more and more and more emotional and all this other stuff happened and and yeah. I was like what is going on I said because you've never talked about it before so you didn't even realize how much it was affecting you so yeah. I was suffering in silence without realizing I was suffering in silence so yeah. talking oh, about it it's very very important I'll ask you a quick question about therapy I've never had therapy yeah but does it ever make you do the the person that's doing the therapy session do they ever make you angry like are you ever angry at them for asking you any questions <laughs> uh no and i'll i'll tell you why <laughs> when i started therapy i went to therapy for a specific reason a specific mental health situation which i don't think i need to bore you with here and it's quite complex. It's extremely complex. I had to see a clinical psychotherapist first for three months. And then I got to speak to a therapist. So just, uh, I think she's a psychologist or something. And we spent five weeks just talking. And um, every appointment for an hour, we'll just talk about how was your day, this, that, the other. And I remember after the fifth session, I said, uh, excuse me, when are we starting the therapy <laughs> part of the therapy? And she now said to me, she now said to me, I've had, I had to build your trust, know how you are. So that there were trigger questions he had asked me to see how I reacted to them that I didn't even notice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she knows what pisses me off, what makes me happy, what lights up my face. She knew all these things. And I, and they have the best poker faces 
like they're just they're like mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm. but there's so much they're taking in that you don't even realize so by the time the therapy started and she asked question we built that trust that I didn't I didn't kind of like feel like I needed like you know why are you asking me that question for you're too personal mm -hmm. you know it didn't feel like that at all okay at mm -hmm. all at all so they build a trust with and I'm, it's the first I've had therapy ever but they that. build that trust with you mm -hmm. so that they know what you can take what you can't take and when you start a session the one of the first questions they ask is how are you how was your day what's been going on and you can either answer with oh i'm okay but before you know it you wanged on about something that pissed you off three days ago that you didn't even realize pissed you off and that would make them change whatever they were going to talk to you about on that day so it just kind of they 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 know what they're doing and they're very good and yeah, but is it a case that is it a case that people your husband your friends mm -hmm. they do ask you how are you is it the case that because we're paying for these we know that they have an expert tag that's why we're mm -hmm. comfortable talking to them or is it the case that we know these people who ask us how are you in our close network of uh, friends and family they really don't care they just want it's, to know it's, it's I just want you to say yes or no is it is no, it the no, case no, no, no. so I would say, for me personally, if I ask you how you are, I can tell you a million percent. I have at least half an hour to listen to you. Um, I wouldn't ask right. you how you are if I'm not ready to get right, a genuine good. answer. And the same for if someone asks me how I am, like I don't even wait my husband wait for my husband to ask me if I'm okay. I go to him, hand I'm on telling. him, say, um, "Do I look uh -huh. okay to you?" or something. Like I'll start and then I'll tell okay. him. And okay. most of the time, I just need him to listen. So. But also, yes, because you're paying this person and I'm a very results oriented person, I'm going to this person because I need your help. So I um, need you to fix me. I need you to fix, exactly, not fix, yeah. but fix this thing. So, so if so I you have open to up. pay you, yes, mm. if I have, if this is what I need to do to get to where I want to go, mm. like I still yeah. asked the last week, like, okay, when am I going to get to where I need to get to? I've told you I don't want to take the pills, even though two days ago, I was like, maybe I should take the pills. But I don't want to take the pills. I don't want to alter anything. I just kind of want to do it properly like do it naturally before i put any other thing in my system and yes you're paying them to do their job but you almost have to give complete trust that they know what yeah, they're yeah, doing. Yeah. and also yeah, you can always change you can always change the therapy if you're not happy there are people that only want to talk to a black therapist there are people that only want to talk to a woman there are people that don't want to talk to a mom or you know a man you can pick and choose uh, who when you, you go, go home with. When you go home after a therapy session, do you then talk to your husband about what you spoke about in the therapy session? I'm allowed to, but, and I think also my husband tends to know how therapy, because obviously I do it here because we're all at home. And he knows how it's gone by how quickly I come downstairs afterwards. So, mm. and if it's a particularly heavy session, the therapist always says, you need to, I need to video myself and kind of recap what's happened yeah. so that I can I don't know why she said to do but the sense that you say after this record it just video yourself and talk about everything that's happened and more stuff is going to come out for you and blah 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 and I'd be like okay what kind of witchcraft is this but it does work you know? <laughs> but also no sometimes my, my husband will say how was therapy how was it today was it okay he can tell by my body language as soon as I come downstairs sometimes yeah. I just want to hug afterwards Sometimes I don't want to talk about it. And sometimes my son runs in and back to normal life. So it just depends, really. Gee, I have to say thank you for just sharing that with us because I know some people would not want to sort of speak about their experience of going to a therapist or even some people are running away from going to see a therapist. Um, so mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that with us and, it's, and your experience of what it feels like um, signing up and what it feels like afterwards and after each session. But what I wanted us to talk about now is the effects of religion on mental health, um, because we know that religion is a good foundation for our, it does uplift us. So it gives us a sense mm -hmm. of community, a sense of belonging, um, a, a place to belong to. And this is in all or many faiths. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the similarities between different religions. But then we know that it also has negative effects. Um, mm -hmm. For example, when somebody says things like, um, if you do this, God is going to punish you or you'd be abandoned because you've done this. And that's when people take it to be quite extreme. Um, Jude, what's your views in regards to religion on mental health? Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> religion, man. Religion is, is great. Like you, you've already said it. 
they they like uh, part of uh, I would say societies societies uh, came out of uh, I don't really like to use religion, but yeah, society came out of religion, society that we have today. So religion is fantastic, but over time, uh, different societies have defined their own ways of doing things, and um, religion is broad. So we're talking Christianity, every other aspect, Islam, and then we have the African traditional side of things. I don't want to use that word, but that's it. Yeah, but societies have always had ways they dealt with uh, people with ill mental health. Uh, some of my experiences or uh, stories I was told when I was young, back home, if uh, if a relative or person in the community back in Nigeria was had ill mental health, they mainly took that person to they kind of ostracize the person out of the community. Yeah. He goes, mm -hmm. he or she goes to be in a sort of a herbalist home where they heal them. So they, the process is always healing. At the end result is healing. They attempt mm. to heal, to want to cure yeah. you of this madness. Mm -hmm. But maybe the processes that they will follow up to that place, that's the process that are not really fine. And that's mm -hmm. the same thing with churches. I know of a, of a, of a cousin, not a cousin, but I'll call him a cousin. We live together. He was older than me. Uh, this guy, brilliant guy, he, when he picked up a pen to write, you will think a professor. And the mother used to cook food and sell for people out of the street. One day he was jumping around and he fell into the whole big, big pot of oil on the oil splashed on him. And as a result, he started to have uh, shocks and epilepsy, yeah. epileptic yeah. shocks. Yeah. And the sister was attending a white and white garment church at the time, Celestia Church. And she thought this was their mother uh, using witchcraft on him because mm -hmm. all of this started affecting the young man. He went just he mm -hmm. isolated himself and they took him to that church. And uh, we would take food to him every evening. My mom would cook, we'll go give him food. Lovely young guy. But one time we started to see a serious change in his mental uh, health. Yeah. This man was, he presented as very unkempt and he was getting mm -hmm. slimmer with all the food. We then realized that he was chained in a room. They were trying to use prayers and holy water and what have you to cure him. So this has been coming on before religion, all of these sort of practices from different societies. In the UK, they probably hang the woman if she was mad or throw her into the water, call her a witch. It happened in Europe. Europe would burn them at the stake. Latvia, mm -hmm. Lithuania, Russia, they had their own ways of dealing with it. Yeah. And church came and church wanted to go with the healing process. But to do that, you have to first get out of the, of the community. Then what then happened in there is what we don't know. It's what we, what we don't like. Don't forget this is people to people doing these things. To people, people, get, people are bad. So there'll be, there'll be some people who will do things properly. And there'll be some people who will mm -hmm. then do things badly to these people. Religion and mental health, they don't work. Because first of all, jokingly, I say to people, uh, mental ill health, some people say they hallucinate, they hear things, yeah? They talk about grandeur things and all of these things. Because my friend did a research on this, and me and he, her, we 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 studied together. What does the pastor do? The current Pentecostal pastors they talk about grandeur things. I don't want to go live in some sky, and they also say they hear from God and angels and all. And this is something that mimics what mental health is. Mental people with ill mental health some, sometimes have the grandeur thinking that they're somebody so special. They are kings when they are not kings. Some pastors call themselves kings when they're actually not kings. And the people we email to say, I'm seeing things, I'm hearing voices. The pastor too is hearing voices. So you see why they shouldn't be together because they can't really, because the pastor won't really see there's anything wrong with this guy. They will start, they'll start to use this guy for money. It wasn't the Bible too. When they heard a lady hearing voices, they started to use that to make coins. Yeah, so yeah. I'll say go very far when it comes to your ill mental health, the church, the mosque, or the African traditional way, it's not the way for you to go. You need to seek the ways of the experts. There's I'm not a... saying run from your church. You can take no, prayers, no, no. but yeah. don't go there for the end yeah. game. No. I was going to say, there's a psychologist I follow. I don't even think I follow her because I didn't know she was, I know there's doctor in her name, but I didn't know she was an actual psychologist. I, I followed her because she's a Christian lady and she... Um, I don't know if she's written books or I don't know if she's a minister. I don't know what she is, but I like her. And she does also inspirational stuff. And and then she announced last week that she's actually, she's just signed, I think, a seven-figure book deal with um, one of the big publishing companies to do like six books on religion and mental health. Mm. And something like that. I, I think I even commented that I will buy all of them. 
because I haven't come across anything like that where religion and mental health and psychology is done. And it's a black woman as well. So already I'm definitely going to buy the book mm. because I think there's something she's probably going to touch on that will relate more to black women and maybe black people than otherwise, uh, because that's one of the reasons I follow her. So I think it's good when we have experts in kind of both areas that can merge the two together without feeling like, you know, you've been ostracized by one or the other because like Jude said sometimes you do kind of have to pick one or the other uh, as opposed to using the two together the only other person I know that's done it really well that I I I get how she does it and it makes sense to me and has enriched my life especially while I'm going through therapy is Iyala Van Tan because Mm -hmm. she comes from a religious background she uses a spiritual way to explain certain things and help you like how to think and things like that so I watch her shows I watch her um, speeches and whatever on uh, on YouTube so I really like how she does Oprah does it sometimes but not too much but at least Yana is like a she's an expert in sort of fixing you as her, as her show says but to have an actual expert psychologist coming out with a book where he brings religion and spirituality into it I think is a very very good idea because at least you can help yourself without necessarily because a lot of people don't want to talk about it they want to talk because people think oh you're crazy or you're mad or whatever stigma is attached because there is a huge stigma attached to talking about mental and it took me to have a breakdown before I I had a breakdown a couple of years for me to realize there's something wrong with it but up until that point I was one of the people that you don't talk about mental health well-being because especially in the black community it's like oh you're going crazy you're mad you just kind of live with it for as long as you can until one day some people just says some no. people note it down as being things like a punish i'm still going a punishment from god or it's been said that when people believe that god has abandoned them or when they sort of question god's love for them some of them even tend to experience greater emotional um distress and that can mm. sometimes lead to early death um so depression is there when people are sort of like god why have you forsaken me why have you why are you not answering my questions why have you not yeah. answered my prayers um, Tyna, what's your views in regards to the I think, topic I think, of... is, I think this is a very good conversation and topic in general. Um, from a personal point of view, I think what Jude and Gia said, I, I agree with what they said. Um, but from my experience, I go to a church that's quite modern. Um, so I'm a Christian, I go to a church that's quite modern. And my pastor, we talk about depression, we talk about anxiety a lot in our mm-hmm. church. So for me, that's been one of the reasons why my mental health has been in good stead because every week, you know, mm. when the subject comes up, we're getting like a refreshment and something yeah. you said, G, we had a, um, a few years ago, we had a, 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 a couple's retreat thing and they had uh, two pastors that came in, Pastor Banful, the name is, and his wife, I can't remember her first name, I think it's Jane Banful, but she is also a psychologist and a pastor like a pastor a pastor's wife mm-hmm. christian mm-hmm. So it was really interesting hearing yeah how she spoke about it as well because she brought something different into the church because she was dealing with the world and people in the world and mental health and that kind of stuff and then combining it with christianity it yeah. was so powerful mm-hmm. um so i think that not just christianity or whatever you want to call it religion i call it faith personally but you know all religions should be having these kind of conversations whether it's islam whether it's judaism whatever it is i think everyone especially judaism actually especially judaism because i know my wife has worked with um uh um jewish people what do they call them the ones that are um, orthodox yeah orthodox jews yeah and she she's worked in their house because she's looked after some some of the children all this kind of stuff and boy some of the stories that she's told me they like some of them must go through serious mental health because you know they're still living in, <laughs> in yeah. You know, yeah, in that era, <laughs> BC. Yeah. Um, so BC. <laughs> yeah, so I think that all religions should really be talking about this stuff, and if not, then they're really letting down the people. Um, yeah, you know, because it's so well, religion, religion like, can have a large impact on mental health. Um, it can, it does reduce things like alcoholism, um, alcoholism. Sorry. Um, suicide rates, even down to depression and things, it does reduce, as we said, as I said earlier, with the structure, just having faith. There's something about having faith 
um, that does build our well-being and our mental health. But what I'm going to do, because I'm conscious of time as well, is a quick fire round. And I'm just going to ask each of you just what you do to help sort of improve your own mental health. Just a quick. So for me, I do certain things like um, talking to my friends, um, sort of my hair, my nails, the general things that a woman does. And at the same time, things like watching TV, having conversations with my husband. Um, Jude, what do you do to help improve your own mental health? I read a lot. I bury my head in a book a lot. And uh, I go running every day, but a couple of days I haven't been because of my knee. And, I, and in the night, I go out again for an hour or two hours work. Because yeah. uh, it really helped me during when, when I was going to school. If I was really stuck on what to write on my essay, just going out for a walk or a run, things would just start flowing. So that is what I do. And, uh, and I indulge in what, whatever just comes out, I want to do. Like the other day, a friend bought me some nice African food. And I said, wow, something good would go with this. And I just go get a bottle of whiskey and I do my thing. If I'm not in the mood, I won't do it. I don't push. I don't know if I indulge. And I like to talk to people, but very, very few people, because um, there are some people you have conversations with, and it just goes from A to Z, man. You're covering everything, and you feel mm-hmm. so refreshed. So I've got a couple of those people, and have those conversations on, with them on the phone. I could be mm-hmm. hours with them. And I talk politics a lot. My wife talks politics, so we talk politics. It can be heated. Not heated, because we're arguing against each other, because I'm so passionate about it. So we're exactly. going, rah, 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 rah. all of this does help. We talk about yeah. life things. I and mean, we just talk, we just talk. But for me, I'm not saying my mental health is straight up par there because I don't know. I'm pretty sure if I go therapy, man, they'll be digging a lot of things <laughs> that even me would just get up and say, hey, whoa, run, run from yourself, <laughs> run from your shadow. I know I need therapy. Look, I'm so bad. I don't even let people touch me. I've not had a massage once in my life. What is that? I don't know. So yeah, I do need therapy. But this is what I do to keep myself. I read a lot. I read yeah. every kind of books, religious, Bible, everything. I like uh, reading. So Okay. G, what do you do in regards to sort of to help improve your own mental health? Um, I, well, this is very timely. I had a particularly difficult week and mental health wise. And it took me a couple of days to figure out what the problem was. But because of the therapy, I know that the best thing for me to do is to ride the wave. It's a wave. It will come. Mm you go just ride it feel what you want to feel and I didn't feel like talking so I was quiet which is very yeah. rare in this house I was very quiet but I kind of had to just feel everything out and again I wanted to come out correct with what I needed to say without shouting or whatever but yeah. when I finally was coming out of it music for me music heals me in so many music saved my life um, my that's my personal testimony music saved my life every time so for me, it's to find that right song or to hear that. And I have an auntie that if I'm feeling a certain I can't put, I don't know what's going on, she'll send me a song. Yeah. Like she knows me that well. I would say, oh, she'll just send me a song. And so for me, it's definitely music. I don't do journaling as much as I should do because it does help, but I'm practicing it more. And obviously talking to your friends, there's some friends of mine, there's two of them in particular. If I'm video calling you, we, I need to see your face because I need you sort of thing. So mm-hmm. even if they're working during the work day, I just call them up and it's just nice to have that sort of like security blanket to talk to. And obviously my husband's there. I can always be like, babe, I'm not okay. And he, mm-hmm. he, he, he kind of has a checklist of things that could upset me. So once it's run through that checklist and there's nothing on there, then we'll, we'll still talk about it, but at least, you know, he knows. And the times when he'll pick up something that I haven't even realized, oh yeah, that's what the problem is. You know, so mm-hmm. music and then talking to your BFFs just really helps. Okay, and Tyler? Um, yeah, similar. So I've got a few friends that I would have long conversations with, hours, um, both male and female. Um, obviously, I talk to my wife. We talk about everything. Um, so that's, mm-hmm. that's good. I go to church, you know, obviously throughout lockdown, I do like the videography and stuff for my church. So I've been in church hearing the word live every week. Um, so that helps, um, you know, reading the Bible helps, praying helps, you know, just chilling out, watching films, creating, being creative, you know, um, yeah, yeah. staying creative, it keeps my mind going, listening to music, you know, I listen to a lot of music, a range of different music, mm. um, 
recently yesterday i heard a justin bieber song i'm not a justin bieber fan but i heard this song which one yeah it's been quite good it's been quite good for the past face. couple of years I love, it. I love the melody off my what face song? sorry what song was it off my face oh, i don't off know that one yeah, he's exactly. been doing a lot of uplifting music man yeah for quite always two or three years music that I like is it. spirit yeah man just things like that you know i just mm. just yeah just and obviously, I've got a daughter as well that's, um, you know, 20 months old. So, yeah. So, you know, it's just about, yeah. it's about me anymore. You know, it's, yeah. there may be times when I'm feeling a bit down or whatever, but I have to think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up someone else now. So I need to, not that I need to now, you know, forget about what, what's going on, but I need to now find a way to either talk about it or get out of it or yeah, yeah. find joy in every situation, you know? So, joy, yeah. that's the key word, joy. Whatever brings you joy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys for tuning in. Today we've been talking about mental health and the reality of it. Um, if you can please just ensure that you subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell as well and like this video. Um, we will see you next week. And this is us, and we have arrived. Toodles. Peace out, people. <laughs>